hello hello good evening good afternoon good morning good night good day whatever time it is where you are welcome it's good to be with you uh, let's get started let me pray Heavenly Father we thank you ever so much for all the wonderful things that you're doing in our lives Lord some of us are facing difficulties but Lord you were your word declares that in all things we are to give thanks so we give you thanks, Lord, for the things that we sometimes don't understand. And we thank you, Lord, for those things that are going so great in our lives. We give you praise in and thanks in all things. Bless us now as we look into this session. May your name be glorified. May your kingdom be exalted. May your word be proclaimed. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Bless you. Welcome once again. Okay, let's get started. Okay, our scriptures. We're now up to 11, it looks like. Yeah. Psalm. They're ready? Let's go. Um, we up to number 11 now. The first one, uh, whatever order. But once we've been practicing and studying and memorizing, regardless of what scripture I call out, you'd be able to speak it verbatim because that is the purpose of this exercise. Okay, let's go. Psalm 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Philippians 4.4 4, Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. John eleven thirty five says, Jesus wept. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Psalm 91, verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And Hebrews 11, verse 1 says, Now, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today and forever psalm 35 verse 1 says i will bless the lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth and the one we'll learn this evening or add to our list this evening is romans 12 21 and it says be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good Let's say it again romans 12 21 be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And those are our scriptures for this evening. I hope you're memorizing them. Study them, memorize them, stick them on your mirror. You know, be creative with it. And, you know, you'll learn them in no time. You'll know them and they'll be a part of your arsenal to be able to defeat the enemy and grow in Christ. And that's the purpose of all of this it's all about growing in Christ and getting closer to him okay our topic this evening is he alone is holy he alone is holy when we consider what it means to be holy we often think of a tall slender person in a long white robe with a hat and they're walking and look like they're floating on a cloud walking down and the cherubims are singing and the music is on the organ and everybody is marching and we look at that and we say okay that's holy and that's something we've painted in our mind of what holy is and what holy is not but what we have to remember is that holiness or being holy it's not a look or a sound Holy is holy. It doesn't have to look a certain way or sound a certain way. Holiness is just that. Holiness. And when what we need to do is let Jehovah tell us what is holy. He told us to be holy. And so he must know what is holy. What he is telling us when he tells us to be holy. 
because he tells us to be holy. What he's telling us to do is to become more like him because he is holy. He alone is holy. He is the only entity in all of creation that is holy. Jehovah is holy. Revelations 15, 3 to 4 says, And they sang the song of Moses, uh, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So this scripture is saying, for thou only art holy, only Jehovah is holy. Only Jehovah is holy. But we often hear um, sermons and comments about hunger for holiness. Everybody wants to be holy. We're hungry for holiness. We want to be holy. We want to be holy. What is that? What is that all about? This hunger for holiness. What are we saying? Or what are people saying when they say they hunger for holiness? Well, what we should be saying is that we hunger for Jehovah. That phrase should, should well, it can say hunger for holiness. But what is holiness? What he said, Jehovah alone, thou alone art, thou alone art holy. So only Jehovah is holy. We hunger to be like him. We hunger to please him. We hunger too for his presence. We hunger for his power. Because he alone is holy, we hunger for him. When we say we hunger for holiness, we're saying we hunger for him. If we seek consistently and constantly to satisfy that hunger for holiness, we will find ourselves becoming more and more and more like Jehovah. If we hunger for it and thirst after it and consistently seek after it, we will find ourselves becoming more and more like Jehovah. Why? Because he alone is holy. We are all familiar with the saying that goes that we become like the people we hang around. And some of us are quite familiar with it and we have proven it in our lives. Some of us are even living it right now because we are becoming like the people we hang around. We find ourselves doing things that we thought we would never do. How did, how, how I manage getting to be doing this kind of stuff? It's because if we just take a look, take a moment and look around at the persons we're hanging out with, the persons we're surrounding ourselves with, we find ourselves doing what the people we hang around are doing. All we have to do is check our friends check the people we hang around with we'll find that we're doing the same things we they're doing whatever we find ourselves trapped in we'll find that our friends are usually carrying on the same kind of activity because we are constantly around these people and they are practicing evil therefore we find ourselves constantly practicing evil just like they are what is wonderful about this law though is that it's like a two-edged sword, like a double-edged sword. Why? Because the principle works for evil the same way it works for good. So that's a good thing. If you hang around good people, you become good. If you hang around evil people, you become evil. So it's good that the, 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 the sword cuts both ways. It's good that it's equally as effective for good or for evil. So we can become good, yes. Jehovah says we can become good. What is Jehovah requiring of us? Is he requiring this goodness? In Leviticus 11, 44 to 45, it says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So Jehovah is telling them to be holy. Okay, wait. If only Jehovah is holy, how come he's asking them to be holy? Okay, what does that mean? What is Jehovah saying? What he's saying is that his spirit within us is what is holy. 
what is holy about us, what becomes holy about us, his spirit that lives within us. Not our flesh, not our carnal nature. It is the Holy Spirit that is living within us, living the life of God through us. That is what is holy. He is who is holy living in us. His Holy Spirit is the holiness in us or the holiness that he's multiplying and increasing and, and manifesting through us. It's his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is calling us to allow ourselves to become, to become what Jehovah is asking for, to become holy. He wants to shape us into becoming holy. Therefore, he tells us to be holy. Because if we allow his spirit to really do what he wants to do in us, we will eventually spiritually, in our spirits, be holy. Not our flesh. But our spirits will be holy if we surrender to the desire within us to be like him because we have a desire to be good everybody has a desire to be most people have a desire to be good and that good simply means we want to be holy we want to be like our creator we want to be like jehovah we experience this as children we wanted so much when we were children to be good Good. We wanted to be good. Throughout our childhood, we would ask our parents, Am I a good girl? Am I a good boy? I'm a good boy. Hey, mommy. And mommy would say, Yes, you're a good boy. You're a good girl. Yes, you are good. So, naturally, instinctively, when we are born in, in, that, innocent, in that innocence, in that stage and phase of innocence, we want to be good. We want to be known as good. We hunger to be good. Once our parents tell us we are good, we are happy. My mommy says, I am a good girl. But as we went along in development and we got the television and the internet and all the other social media stuff, all that seemed to have changed because now the villain is being glorified. So now the villain is good. He's become more desirous, more popular, and he's bad. But he is now the one that's being glorified. And now the children want to be like the villain. But that's after they've passed through that phase of innocence because they come into the world pure and innocent. But of course, the influences around shift them their thinking. It kind of guides their thinking into this twisted, distorted kind of place where they end up. And the world today through television and internet causes them to shift. Now, as we become um, adults, we grow, develop, become adults, we are now, we now have to make a choice those who would expose themselves to the gospel to the bible to church to spiritual godly principles now would change their in in a heart their spirit would now become desirous to be like christ they would now have a, a hindering or hinting or moving towards good again they started out as children, leaning towards good, as innocent children, leaning towards good. And once that is cultivated and nurtured and the, the borders are put up to keep out the evil influences, you continue to move along this, this walk, this road, to seek to be good. And who alone is good? Who alone is holy? Jehovah. So we are now, if we get that influence in our younger years and our teenage years and as we become an adult, we would now have more and more influence from the kingdom of God, from the spirit of God, from the Holy Spirit. And that would cause us to continue with this desire to be good. We would continually want to be good. We know that it's through the Holy Spirit working within us that makes us want to be good. But if we indulge in sinful acts, we now feel condemned, we feel bad. Why? Because we understand that good is Jehovah. Good is pleasing God. Now, we know that we have the Spirit of God in us if when we indulge in these things, we feel bad about it. We feel, oh, really, really miserable. I should not have done that. That was not good. When we have that kind of an attitude, we know that the Spirit of God is working in us. Why? Because He alone is holy. He alone is good. So when we have that kind of impression in our life, we know that He is working with us because we now have this desire to be good. And we're miserable when we miss the mark, when the Bible calls it sin. 
sin is missing the mark and we are now feeling really bad when we do things that we know displeases Jehovah now those who are not influenced fluence in any way by the Spirit of God they feel no remorse when they practice evil none whatsoever they revel in it they enjoy it they seek to do even more why because the Spirit of Jehovah is absent and if the Spirit of Jehovah is absent only one of the spirit there is to come in and that's the spirit of evil so that comes in and causes them to enjoy doing wicked stuff enjoy doing evil and continuing in there to do even more Proverbs 2 Proverbs chapter 2 verses 10 through 14 says when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul discretion shall preserve thee understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man from the man that speaketh forward things who leave the path of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness who rejoices to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked so what it says is rejoice to do evil when we have no influence from the good the God God Jehovah the Holy One when we have a vacancy or a vacant area where none of his spirit is his spirit does not exist all we have left is we rejoice to do evil no influence from the righteous or from the Spirit of God whatsoever evil will be rampant in our lives it will be ever increasing however on the other hand when we make a decision to allow the Holy Spirit to control our actions and control the things we do control everything about us then we will make decisions to allow him to completely control our life we become more and more and more holy we become more and more and more like Jehovah when we look at the life of the psalmist David we know David wrote most of the Psalms we find that he perfected the art of worship he perfected the act of worship he worshiped constantly he wrote about how he hungered and thirst for God he cultivated and nurtured his hunger for Jehovah as a young boy he spent most of his days in the pastures weeks months days on end alone in the fields watching his father's sheep the only person he could talk to was Jehovah couldn't talk to the sheep because they couldn't talk back they couldn't even but Jehovah could speak to him through his spirit so he was able to make a solid connection with Jehovah God this God that his father and his family and his his whole heritage taught him about this God of heaven and earth the creator of heaven and earth he was able to connect with that the more intense the more he communicated with Jehovah the more intense his relationship and the more intense the presence of Jehovah became in his life out there in the fields he wasn't no church or no cathedral no no um, um, temple nowhere he was in the fields but the intense power and presence of Jehovah was evident in his life David was be seeking to become more and more and more like Jehovah David was seeking to become holy like Jehovah Jehovah's presence was so heavy on David's life that he was able to kill a lion and a bear without any skillful um, weaponry he didn't have any spare any anything like that he didn't have any javelin all he had was probably his step um, shepherd's rod and maybe a knife to you know help clean up the sheep and stuff like that but he didn't have any skillful weaponry like a bow and arrow and all that sort of stuff he didn't have any of that but in 1st Samuel chapter 17 verse 34 to 36 it says and David said unto Saul thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth and when he arose against me I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him thy servant also slew a lion both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine he was talking about Goliath and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God so here is David he is not afraid because he knew what Jehovah has already brought him through 
the presence of Jehovah protects us. He strengthens us through his presence, through his power. He gives us the ability to do incredible things. When we are constantly practicing the presence of Jehovah, it's as though uh, a portal opens up over us. Like a portal open up, opens up over our lives, over our wherever we are. It opens up over our lives, over our homes, over our area. Why does this portal open? It opens so that Jehovah is able to have, we are able to have direct access to him. The presence of God, when it shows up, it clears out the space, clears it out completely. And even though we, we, um, we may have this access to Jehovah, this direct access to Jehovah, that does not mean that evil things will not happen. Bad things still would happen. Evil things may happen, but they cannot fulfill their purpose. The Bible says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So those are the three things he always comes to do. If he ever missed the mark, you know it because you're not dead. So his ultimate goal is to kill you, and he did not fulfill that purpose. And we cannot believe that we will achieve our goals without Jehovah's influence. When we come and worship Jehovah and praise him consistently and constantly, the angelic host of heaven goes to war on our behalf. They come, they, they, they gravitate towards the presence of God. So if we are cultivating the presence of God in our lives, we will always have angelic assistance because they hearken to the voice of his word. So if we're constantly in his word, constantly speaking his word, worshiping him, praising him, we, they come into our presence. And they're not there to look around. They are there to protect us, to help us, to promote the presence of God and the protection of God in our lives. The Spirit of God brings protections to our lives. We are becoming, because we're practicing this habit, this attitude, this, this um, presence, we are practicing this so it causes us to become more and more like Jehovah. We take on his nature. We receive his anointing. His way of doing things becomes our way of doing things. His way of doing things is right and righteous and this is what happens in our lives when we cultivate his presence when we cultivate a relationship with him sometimes we cultivate it to the point that our, our friends don't even understand us anymore sometimes they call us weird and strange and you don't have to do all that and why are you doing all this and yes sometimes people will not understand us when we get to the point where we are just at the point where you know what is God or nothing I'm just going to continue to press into God and get as much of his presence in my life as I can. And sometimes your friends don't understand that. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, David has an opportunity to get rid of an enemy that was chasing him down all over the land of Israel. Chasing him. Every city he go to, he, he run from that city and the person come to that city looking for him. Chasing him down. 1 Samuel chapter 34 verse 3 to 6 says, and he came to the sheep coat, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went into, in there to cover his feet and um, to relieve himself. And, David's, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off this because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. David did not understand, David's men did not understand this logic. They did not understand this. Here you are with a golden opportunity to get rid of your enemy once and for all. This man has been chasing you all over creation, trying to kill you, trying to end your life. And you have an opportunity to destroy him and you pass it up. And then what's worse, you now are now grieving over the fact that you cut his skirt. 
You cut the cloth off of his robe and you're upset about that. He is trying to kill you. You were supposed to kill him. Here you are crying over the fact that you've cut his skirt. Really, this doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense up to them what David is doing. But David is very distraught over the fact that he went and the intentions of his heart was to hurt Saul, was to kill him, was to get rid of this enemy. But David had to check that and run that by the Spirit of God to see if that's what God would have him to do. They upset. What are you what are you crying about? David had come become so much like Jehovah because of the time he spent in prayer, in worship, in the presence of Jehovah, he was now becoming like Jehovah. He was now becoming like Jehovah. His intentions, his motives were now under scrutiny by Jehovah. And he was thinking, is this something Jehovah wants me to do? Is this what Jehovah wants me to do? And jo jo David was now becoming like Jehovah. He was now becoming holy. David became deeply convicted when he entertained the thoughts of taking revenge on his enemy, King Saul. He was now really distraught. David was a warrior. Think of this now. David was a warrior. David was a man of war. David couldn't build the temple of the Lord because the Lord said he shed too much blood. So David was a skilled warrior. Even as a boy, David went out and he took a sling and he drilled a hole in, 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 in uh, Goliath's skull. He sent that stone into Goliath's forehead. And cause him to come face down on the ground. And what David did afterward. David picked up the Goliath's sword. And sliced his head off. He took Goliath's head. Put it in a bag. And he carried it around with him for days. Because back then when you slay your enemy. You take off their head. And you put it on a pole. And you stand it up to show everybody. This the person you always scared of. You see what I did with him. And then everybody would fear you. So David had Goliath's head in a bag for days. So David knew exactly how to utterly destroy his enemy. And he had the courage to do it. So David was not, you know, no wimp. But here he is. He was not going to touch Saul. When he was faced with the opportunity to destroy King Saul, who had chased him all over the place, his arch enemy, he was faced with the opportunity He's laying right there. Let's kill him and be done with it. But David went and thought about it. And he understood that Saul's destruction was Jehovah's responsibility, not his. Revenge, hatred, anger, all that stuff, that's not holiness. So David had to get rid of that. No, 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 I can't do this. Judgment comes from Jehovah, not from me. And David realized because he was spending time with Jehovah and becoming more and more holy, he understood that judgment was Jehovah's responsibility. That was Jehovah's duty to judge and to bring vengeance and to bring wrath. That's Jehovah's responsibility, not mine. It was not his place to bring judgment upon King Saul. That was Jehovah's responsibility. No matter how great a warrior he was, he knew not to cross that line. Do not cross that line. This is Jehovah's responsibility. Do not move into that, that realm. That would put you in Jehovah. It's like you go in now to sit on Jehovah's throne to judge. You're not, uh-uh, don't do that. David knew better than to do something like that. As a student of the Torah, the, the law of God, David knew that Jehovah, he knew what Jehovah said. He knew what Jehovah's law said. Um, he probably studied Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, and it says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that they shall come that shall come upon them make haste. So don't worry about vengeance and wrath and anger and destruction. That's Jehovah. Leave that right over there for him. You continue to walk in holiness, in righteousness. Continue to walk in the love of God. Let Jehovah be holy through you. And holiness is not vengeance and wrath and anger and strife. No, that's Jehovah. Move that over there. 
whoever needs to be judged, Jehovah will deal with that. That's not David's place. And David became so much like Jehovah that he knew what Jehovah wanted done in this situation. How did he get to be that way? Because of the time he spent with Jehovah. He came to understand what pleased Jehovah and what did not please Jehovah. And there was no way he was going to get caught up in anything that was going to displease the one true and living God, his God, Jehovah. He was not going to displease him. David's reaction in this instance demonstrate that he was making great strides towards becoming like Jehovah, towards becoming holy. David was making great strides in that direction, making great strides to becoming holy. He continued to pursue the power and presence of Jehovah, as did Joseph. In the story of Joseph, Joseph ran away from Potiphar's wife. Potiphar was his master, his slave in Egypt, and he ran away from Potiphar's wife because she was making advances to him. And although Joseph was a slave, he still ran from her. How do you run from your master's wife? You do everything she tells you to do, regardless whether it's good or bad, because you don't want to die. She has the power to have you killed. She had the power to have Joseph killed instantly. But Joseph ran from her. He ran from her. He knew exactly what Jehovah's law was regarding sexual purity for young men. He knew that that act would be unholy. It would not be holy. It would not be the nature of Jehovah. In Genesis 39, verse 8 to 9, it says, But he refused. This is Joseph dealing with Potiphar's wife. He refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. He hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither had he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Now how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The bottom line was, if I do this, I will sin against God. The Lord God Jehovah, my God, the one true and living God, I will sin against my God if I did this. Joseph was not confused as to whether this act would please Jehovah or displease Jehovah. He knew based on the Torah, based on the law of God, that he and his family, his father taught him all his life what the Torah, what the law of God um, entailed. What was the law of God? The law of God demanded sexual purity. Joseph was not married to that woman. In fact, she was married to somebody else. So Joseph knew that this was wrong. So what did Joseph do? He ran like his head was on fire. He ran like his clothes was on fire. He ran like a bear was chasing him. He ran. He ran away from her. We must allow Joseph's uh, demonstration to show us how to deal with things that are unholy. We must remember that it's not our flesh that becomes holy. Our flesh just never becomes holy. Our spirit, the spirit of God within us is what is holy. Our flesh is never holy. It is our spirit. And it really is the spirit of Jehovah, the spirit of God that lives within us that is holy. The more time we spend with Jehovah in his word, in praise and worship, in Bible study, the more time we spend with him, the more his presence and power will intensify in our lives. We'll get that protection, that portal open over our lives. Yes, we will get that if we continue to um, surrender to him and allow his presence and his power to ramp up in our lives. We will experience these kind of things. The lion and bear instances, the impossible things, the incredible things that the men and women in the Bible were able to do back in the day. Jehovah is doing the same thing today, but we have to surrender the way they surrendered. The more control he ha we give him, the more control he has over our flesh. But we cannot get to the place where we think that our flesh is holy. I am holy. Oh, really? Your flesh is not holy. We cannot get to the place where we think our flesh is holy. Because when we fall for that lie, 
we take our body and our mind and our spirit to places where they should not be. When we believe that we are strong, the Bible says when you think you're strong, beware. We cannot get to the place where we think our flesh can handle certain things. I can handle being alone with a single person. I can handle being alone with a married man. Don't take your flesh through those kind of tests. Your flesh is not saved. We cannot be thinking that our flesh is strong enough to handle the temptation. Why? Because we only wind up discovering what the Apostle Paul told the Romans. In the book of Romans, verse chapter 7, verse 18, it says, Paul is saying to the Romans, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. In his flesh, he can't do anything good. He has to depend on his spirit, which is now influenced by the spirit of God in order to do good. In his flesh dwelleth no good thing. We must just depend on the spirit of God to work through our spirit. Because as the saying goes, the arm of flesh will fail you. The arm of flesh will fail us. We cannot trust it. Stay away from those situations that we know do not reflect the nature of Jehovah. If you know something is not glorifying Jehovah, stay away from it. Before your flesh get hooked on it, and next thing you know, your flesh is controlling your spirit. Let the Spirit of God control your spirit. And then let the Spirit of God rise up in you to dominate your flesh and keep it under subjection. We will make our hearts, he will make our hearts and our minds the Spirit of God. By the power of God, he will make our hearts, our minds, and our spirits holy. Because those are the only parts of us that can be um, influenced and suppressed by the presence of Almighty God, by the Spirit of God. They can be dominated and ruled by the Spirit of God, based on how much time we spend in the Word, based on how much time we spend in the presence of Jehovah. It now takes our flesh and put it under under wraps, so to speak. Put our flesh under wraps and cause us to be able to tell our flesh, no, you can't have that. That is against, like Joseph, that is against the laws of God. I'm not even going there with you. No, we're not doing that. We get our flesh under subjection. We cannot trust our flesh. First Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil if it looks evil don't even go into it to say oh it looks evil but let me just go investigate no 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 if it looks evil shun it say abstain from all appearance of evil if it appears evil don't go in investigating do what joseph did run run we must run when we find ourselves in those sticky situations you know those sticky situations that we know are against the laws of jehovah we must run away from those because while our spirit our heart and our mind might desire to do all the will of jehovah oh we have good intent we say the road to hell is paved with good intention we have all good intentions in our heart our minds and our spirit but if our flesh ramp up on us we're going to be in big trouble our flesh will betray us every single time. Why? Because our flesh does not have the capacity or the capability to be holy. What Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Our flesh ain't, what do you say? Your flesh ain't saved. Flesh is not saved. Our flesh is not saved. Our spirit is being saved by the spirit of Almighty God, by his Holy Spirit. Jehovah is holy. He alone is holy. He alone can make our spirits holy through his Holy Spirit. He can make us holy. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Do what the Spirit tells you to do. It means to do according to what the Holy Spirit is saying to our spirit. Whatever the Holy Spirit is dictating, our answers should be, Yes, Master. Whatever the Spirit of God, the Word of God, His presence, His power, and, and our knowledge of Him, we know what is good. We know what is righteous. Whatever He's guiding us into that's righteous, we do that. 
and we leave all the rest to him. Let him deal with the rest. But we do not ever, ever trust our flesh. Our flesh can never be holy. Jehovah is holy. His Holy Spirit is holy. And it's working through our spirit. He is holy. Jehovah. He is holy. He alone is holy. God bless you. Bless you. It was a pleasure to be with you this evening. Let me pray and close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. We thank you that you are holy. And through your spirit and by your spirit, you are able to make us holy. Not our flesh, our spirits. You can cause our spirits to be strong, to cause our spirits to dominate, dominate our thinking, dominate our desires, dominate our motivations, our, 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 our understanding, dominate everything about us. You can be dominated by your spirit. The more we open up, the more we understand who you are, the more we love you and the more we will serve you. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you would continue, Lord, to just guide us and direct us, keep us and strengthen us. Let us continue to surrender to your spirit. Help us to stay away from those areas, Lord God, where we know we're going to get in trouble. Help us to continue to cling to you, cling to your word, cling to your people, cling to your family. King, cling to your kingdom. Help us to continue to work the work of your kingdom, Lord. Bless us and keep us. Guide us by the power of your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. Let us rehearse again our scriptures. Let me see. Okay, let's go over them again. Ready? Let's go. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Psalm 150 verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. John eleven thirty five says Jesus wept. 1 Thessalonians five seventeen says Pray without ceasing. And Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And Romans 12 21, the one we're learning today, Romans 12 21 says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. God bless you, bless you. I pray that you're following and practicing and studying and memorizing. This is going to help you to become strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. And like I always say, you could have been doing anything else, but you decided to spend these moments with me. Thank you ever so much, and may Jehovah continually bless your life. Goodbye.